The 1st of March 2000 is etched on the minds of the people of Aberdeen, Australia, forever. Never before, and really never again, has there been a crime of this nature actually perpetrated by a woman in, in Australia. She's disgraceful, I can't, I can't comprehend what she's done. A murder so inexplicably heinous, it still affects all of the officers called to the scene to this day. Nothing could prepare you for what you were about to see. Whatever had done this, it was obviously uh, a monster and we had, to, we had to do something, we had to somehow finish it. The gentleman's head had been located, so we're looking for that. A woman driven to kill in a way that defies comprehension. She's been branded a danger to the community, capable of murdering anyone who crosses her. Oh, there's a pot on the stove. I think I might have even said, so I'll give you one guess where the head is. I didn't eat meat for about three months. The despicable crime committed by Catherine Mary Knight stuns the whole nation and leaves everyone searching for a reason, making this a crime that shook Australia. Aberdeen, in New South Wales, is a small town in the Upper Hunter region, around three hours' drive north of Sydney. Once known for its mining community and abattoirs, it now holds public fascination for a very different reason. Aberdeen is a type of country town which has probably had its best years. The best years are probably behind it now. It was quite an industrial town. Aberdeen is the perfect backdrop for a crime like this, I guess. You know, it's, it's, it's got the cliches. It's got the abattoir that's closed down and the, the grass is growing there. And it's got the, the coal train that runs through town occasionally and the silo and it's got the two pubs, the top pub and the bottom pub. There are a lot of low socioeconomic issues that surround towns such as Aberdeen. Whatever the makeup of the once thriving town, it could never have prepared for the horror that is to unfold in March 2000. I was uh, actually working at Musselbrook that day and received a phone call at the station from a workmate of uh, Mr Price's. We got the call from his boss to say that he hadn't come in and somebody had been out there and the ute was still in the driveway. They couldn't raise anybody. But, you know, not thinking the worst, oh yeah, he's probably tied one on or something <laughs> and hasn't woken up. John Price is a 45-year-old who works in the local mines. Scott Matthews and Graham Furlonger drive to Aberdeen to investigate further. I knew Mr Price before. I knew that he was a hard worker and a reliable man, so it was, was a bit unusual for him not to turn up for work and not to make a phone call. I went up, saw, knocked on the door, uh, didn't get an answer, saw some blood on the door jam. Looked through a little gap into the lounge room, which was dark, reasonably dark, and saw what looked like a bunched up curtain hanging down. Couldn't raise anybody, so I decided we'd go and break into the place, seeing as we had this complaint. I walked around the side, there was a piece of meat just lying on the, on the ground, and anyway, uh, went round the back, broke in through the back door. As we went in, I saw straight ahead of me the, um, what I thought was a curtain. There was something hanging, uh, blocking my entry into the hallway of the house. I, I thought it, it looked like a some type of blanket or a, some sort of covering that had been placed up on the, uh, on the archway. So I, I, I remember I used my left hand to push it aside and immediately I could feel coldness coming on my left arm. So I, I looked down and my left arm was just covered in blood. 
Initially I thought I'd injured myself breaking through the back door, so I couldn't understand why my arm was bleeding. As Graham and Scott try to locate the missing man, they are suddenly faced with the most horrific scene ever to be witnessed. I realised then it was a, a human pelt, it was the skin minus the head. A full skin just hanging from the, from the top of the door frame. Looked past it and uh, saw a torso on the ground without a head and without any genitalia. And uh, I think my first reaction then was to turn around to Scotty and say, don't look Scotty. <laughs> of course, that's the worst thing you could say. I looked through, I could look through there, from there into the, the lounge room and I saw what appeared to be you know, a human being or what was left. And so it was at that point that I, I'd realised you know, what had happened. For something that I'd never seen before, I'd never experienced, I'd, I had an immediate idea of what had gone on. It was at that point that I, I, I drew my service pistol. There was blood everywhere. A line of blood out from the door into the kitchen area. Uh, there's a pot on the stove. I think I might have even said to Scotty, I'll give you one guess where the head is. The scene is beginning to resemble that of a horror film. Yet amidst the carnage, the police uncover what appears to be elements of normal domestic life. On the table, there was a couple of plates that had meals already prepared and vegetables and meat cooked sitting there. Sergeant Furlong was talking to him, he was saying, look, it's going to be all right, we've got to keep going, we've got to finish this, we've got to do whatever it takes. He was talking to me and I'm trying to hear if there's, I could hear anybody else because sometimes a little bit under stress, you get that auditory exclusion and, and, and you're not hearing things, you're just focused on the threat. It was quite a frightening experience, but once you've stepped into that uh, situation, you, you, there's just no backing out. As well as having to deal with a murder like they have never seen before, both officers still have no idea if the person who has carried out this slaying is still in the house. So we went to search the place and we went up the hallway. We heard what appeared to be um, someone snoring coming from one of the bedrooms. So we knew that there was someone alive in the house. Looked in there and there she was lying on the bed. In the sleepy town of Aberdeen in New South Wales, police officers have just uncovered a crime scene like no other. Having been called to check on a man who had failed to arrive for work, they enter his house to be confronted with a gruesome scene. Parts of his lifeless body lie in various rooms, whilst a woman appears to be sleeping in the bedroom. I tried to wake her. She was obviously drugged on something and uh, couldn't wake her properly. She was very groggy. She wasn't responding, um, so we carried her outside and um, put her in the, under, under the back lawn. I wasn't sure whether she'd try to kill herself with sleeping pills or whatever, but she certainly wasn't injured in any other way. The woman who is unresponsive is 49-year-old Catherine Mary Knight, known locally to be the partner of John Price. Having taken what appears to be a concoction of pills, the police rush to call an ambulance. On closer inspection, nobody else is in the house. But who are this couple that have been involved in a scene of absolute devastation? It didn't take too long to really discover that um, Catherine Knight was a woman who, who uh, was quite a strong personality, was quite strong physically, who was well known around the town as, as a family were, and also to build a profile on the victim, John Price, as well, what sort of person he was. John Price and Catherine Knight began a relationship five years earlier, in 1995. Price having been married before, and Knight coming from a string of failed relationships. <laughs> He was hard drinking, hard working, you know, which sometimes doesn't always 
run in line with each other. He was always the first at work, irrespective of how much he drank the night before. He would be up and he would be at work doing his job and normally the first one there. He was a bloke who loved the beer and the smoke, you know, in a sense that, and that's what he enjoyed, I think, initially in, in his companionship with Catherine Knight. And that's what it was all about. Didn't want to have too many cares in the world. And I think when Catherine came along, she filled in that final little gap. Their relationship was quickly established and frequently involved having a good time and socialising. Their circle of friends were all of the same ilk. They were all fast-talking, swearing, tough people. They did use uh, rough language. Uh, they did have rough, tough mannerisms. They were loud and they were boisterous, and uh, when, they were, when they were throwing a party, everybody knew about it. But cracks soon began to appear. She was quite a violent woman. She was quite highly strung. She was quite jealous with all of her partners. And she was, at times, was certainly quite vindictive in her actions against those partners, both physically and, uh, and mentally. This volatile nature displayed by Knight soon escalated, resulting in bizarre behavior. Everything's about revenge and entitlement with Catherine. She's like a B-grade movie in that respect. Pricey had done the wrong thing by her. I think he tried to leave her once or, you know, he'd been at the pub too long. So to, to get revenge, she got the video camera and she videoed a first aid kit she thought that he'd stolen from the mine, you know, I don't know, $20 first aid kit. She took the video of it to the mine's management. And um, Pricey got the sack for it, lost his job over it. That is a pretty catastrophic thing to do to a man. It's, you know, ending his livelihood, ending her livelihood as well. Again, that's the curious element of Catherine. She's quite happy to, you know, hurt even those like herself to get vengeance on somebody else. You know, she doesn't, there's no barrier for her that she won't cross. Pricey's mates all said, mate, get rid of her, she's bad news. Things that she was saying and trying to set him up as having stolen, and in fact he hadn't stolen them at all. There was an out of date first aid kit that was at the mines which had been thrown out. Despite what Knight had done to Price, this didn't signal the end of their relationship. Price he threw her out for three months, but then he took her back. He lost a lot when he took her back. He lost, he'd already lost his job because of her. Then he lost respect of a lot of his mates because he'd taken her back. And his mates couldn't believe that, that he would do that. He couldn't drink at the pub. He had to change pubs because his mates said, you can't have her, you can't have her back in your life. What are you doing, you know? We've, we've nursed you through the last lot of grief and here we go again, you know? So there's a sense of it all closing in on Pricey. And when he makes that decision to get rid of her the last time, he knows it's not going to be easy. And I think it dawns on him pretty quickly that it's going to be really messy. Knight was gradually striking fear into her partner, a fear that would culminate in Price resorting to desperate measures. Pricey had started to confide in his bosses that he was incredibly worried about what was going to happen. He told every time she thumped him or yelled at him or, you know, exacted something else, he rang a mate and said, this is what's happened. And he said, if something happens, I want you to be, you know, to bear witness to what's been going on with me for the last couple of years with this witch of a woman. In the meantime, this vengeful woman has called the police and they've arrived and he said, I want her out of the house. And they said, you have to get a court order to get her out of the house, which infuriated him. It was his house. She didn't live there on a permanent basis. In the last 36 hours, um, he knew something was up. He was trapped. Two nights before he was killed, they'd had a row. She'd held a knife up at him and he fled the house thinking that she's gonna stab him. And he went over the road to his mates and said, you know, she's come at me with a knife. The next day, the police rocked back up to Pricey's with an AVO that they, by law, had to take out on her behalf because she had called the police and she had accused him 
of being violent toward her. Despite the restraining orders and involvement from the local police, Price chose to maintain contact with Knight. With the intimidation and violence escalating, it appears the local miner had a real sense of dread that his partner was capable of anything. Monday, he goes into work and his boss can tell that this is a man who is clearly rattled. They hadn't seen him this rattled in all the time that they'd been working with him. And they said, mate, what's up? And he, he sat down and he told them what she had done and he said to them, I reckon she's gonna do me in. The next day he went to court, this is the day that he was killed, he went to court and he sat down with the chamber magistrate and said, this is what's happened. He told the magistrate that the night before at 2 a.m. in the morning, he's woken up and there she is standing at the foot of the bed with her hands behind her back. And he said he leapt out of bed. He was terrified, he thought she had a knife. He thought that was the night that she was going to do him in. And he said only when she got, he got sort of closer to the mirror, he could see she had nothing behind her back that, you know, the terror, the instant terror stopped. But he couldn't get her out of the house. She just would not go. Despite legal notices served to both of them limiting contact, they seemed to ignore these, which was to result in devastating consequences. The day before his brutal murder, a final comment made by Price would send chills down the spines of everyone that knew him. Price, he had gone over the road with two beers to see his mate and to tell his mate, mate, if you see my van out the front in the morning when you get up to go to work, call the cops, she's done me in. As friends and relatives of John Price are trying to come to terms with his violent murder, the police need to establish how he met his death and who the culprit is. And everything so far is pointing directly to one person. We started to get some statements from witnesses. We needed people who were close to the family, so we dealt mainly with the family of Catherine Knight and, uh, and the family members of John Price. As the investigation gets underway, Knight is kept under close supervision in hospital, suffering from the effects of the drugs she has taken. Catherine Knight was basically in custody, but for some time she's going to be, um, she's going to be laid up. She's going to be uh, possibly unconscious. That gave us a little bit of breathing space. We knew that we weren't going to get a chance to interview or even begin thoughts of interviewing Catherine Knight until she was uh, completely well enough. Whilst detectives wait to interview Knight to see what she will reveal, forensic investigators arrive to look for any clues that can determine what has actually happened in the house. I got a phone call from VKG, which is uh, police radio, telling us there'd been a murder. And I said to the operator, well, we're heading out to murder. I said, well, he's been decapitated. With the graphic description of how Price has been found, Peter Musio is expecting a gruesome scene, but nothing can prepare him for what he is to see next. We came in through the laundry at the back of the premises and you get, there's an aroma and uh, it was quite a uh, oh, macabre thing. It's a, a sweet odour, nice odour, as if uh, mum's cooking a stew. Just like his colleagues before him, Peter is soon to discover the grim reality of the smell lingering in the kitchen. But he is first confronted with the rest of the killer's destruction. Walk inside and one of the first things you see is Mr Price's uh, skin or pelt hanging from the, the door, from a meat hook. I searched through the, um, the pelt for Mr Price's genitals. Further into the kitchen, you could see blood staining on certain items. Into the lounge room, there was a body. Further down the hallway, there was uh, blood staining down towards the bedrooms. You could see where I think Mr. Price has gone for the light switch. There's uh, blood staining on the light switch and also blood that had he coughed or something onto the wall. You could see this expiration mark on it. 
Analyzing the scene, Peter tries to retrace Price's steps. The victim has firstly been attacked whilst lying in bed, then has tried to run for his life. But as you go out towards the lounge room, this blood stain's getting heavier and heavier. Big swipes on the wall where he's blood soaked himself and sliding against the wall. It's also getting lower. As if he's sort of, and it comes to culmination at the foyer where he's just succumbed to his injuries. He's actually opened the front door and there's blood spatter on the screen door. So he's nearly made it out. Not that it would have helped him. He would have died certainly, but uh, you just see the enormity of where it starts in the bedroom and just progressively worse and worse till you get to that point where he's died. In the blood pool, it was the width of the hallway, which is probably 1.2 metres wide. John Price has been stabbed 37 times and the attacker has shown no mercy, continuing with the most barbaric acts. As if the crime scene could not get any worse, Peter has the difficult task of examining the remains of the victim's body. When we examine the body, you could see the body has been there in its entirety. There was a big stain on the floor where the head would have been. It's been skinned first. You can see where she'd placed the skin on the carpet to sit it there, and it's, it's quite a substantial staining. There's also an outline of the head, so she's then taken the head off there. You can see where she's walked in carrying it to the kitchen. There's a drip, 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 drip of blood all the way leading to the cooktop. But until we actually lifted the lid off, um, it wasn't confirmed. The killer, having already decapitated and dismembered this man, hasn't stopped there, as the police are drawn to something else in the kitchen. They go in and there's a meal on the table, for God's sake. There's vegetables, there's gravy, there's his meat, which he's cooked in the oven. You saw it in a horror movie, you'd almost laugh because it's just so over the top. These are the things those coppers saw that day. And um, these are the things that never leave them. To me, they were a statement. She had cut, I think it's the glutamus maximus, the doc called it, off his uh, backside. And it's a, it's a big muscle. And she's cut that into five different steaks. And she's cooked them, baked them in the, in the oven. Two of them were on one plate to another plate, and the fifth one was out for the dog, I believe. But it wasn't touched. But uh, the meals were there like a trophy. They had the names of each person who was supposed to get them. The names displayed with the meals are two of John Price's relatives, prepared and arranged, ready for them to come in and discover. But neither meal has been touched. Despite the confronting crime scene, Peter and his colleagues still have to gather what evidence they can. In the kitchen, there was um, items that had been used. There was a jug with uh, blood-stained handprint on it. So you collect that, that gets processed further back at the lab. A lot of the items were taken back, like the knives. Uh, there's a honing steel. There's also a, um, a sharpening stone. Like we had to get DNA material from all of those. There was a piece of um, cooked meat out on the backyard, so we collected that. As the harrowing nature of what has happened begins to sink in, Bob Wells gets the chance to interview their prime suspect. I got the op opportunity to interview Catherine Knight about five days after the incident. Even though it was a lengthy interview, it didn't take us very far in relation to any admissions by Catherine. can't remember anything. Do you recall yourself going to bed? Faintly. It was always maintained by Catherine during the interview that she couldn't remember anything. Knight isn't giving anything away about what has happened. But in a lengthy interview, Remarkably, she does accept that she has killed John Price. Catherine presented me during that interview with this scenario that I needed to go and explore. That perhaps that she believes or was claiming that she committed this act because of the severe ongoing domestic violence she had incurred during her life and 
more recently with, uh, with John Price and other partners. She has a rat cunning that she won't then go on and say, yes, this is why I did it. So she's never given the family piece, you know, about why she did it. She's never been honest about it. You know, she blamed him by saying that he had been violent towards her. As Bob Wells explores Knight's suggestions that she was in fact the victim of domestic abuse, more unbelievable details are revealed about the night before the murder, with Catherine taking others out for a meal. Back at the daughter's house, she set up a video camera. Um, she loved that video camera. And she started recording things. There's always a sense of entitlement with Catherine. There's a sense that I own this, I'm owed this, you know, this is mine. Almost like a will, that this is yours, don't let anyone take it from you. It was quite bizarre, it was like a sort of a... She was leaving little bits and pieces of property and it, it was sort of like a last will and testament of, of what Catherine was going to, um, wanted to portray. She had been planning this for, for days. She watches a video, drives to Pricey's home, wakes him up, watches a bit of Star Trek, has sex. She remembers him going for a pee and then uh, he lays back in bed and then she strikes. The slinky black negligee it was later found to have sperm on it. It was found in the bathroom where we, where we believe she showered. I believe we had samples taken from under a fingernail. During the whole gruesome process, police believe Knight has washed, changed her clothing and stolen her partner's wallet before leaving the house to do other things. We know that she left that crime scene at least once and that was to take her car back to her, her home in uh, McQueen Street and park it well up in the backyard, which is another indicator that, to us that it was her possession, it was going to remain her possession. There was also the fact that Price's bank account had some money taken out at, I think, about 12.15am in two $500 lots, which we believe Catherine did at, a, at a, an ATM in Musselbrook. The money was never found. Where did it go? Did she take it somewhere and give it to somebody? Did she bury it somewhere? The disappearance of large sums of money is just one mystery baffling the detectives. And now, days after the carnage, Bob Wells finally has the opportunity to ask pressing questions to their only suspect. But despite admitting to killing her partner, Knight presents an alibi that makes her the victim, not John Price. Could it be the case that John Price was a victim of his own severe domestic and violence towards Catherine Knight and she snapped and couldn't take it anymore? Which gave me the opportunity then to say that I then built the profile around Catherine Knight from the information she provided me during that interview. Interviewing the other partners, it became quite apparent that Catherine Knight, rather than being the victim of domestic violence, was more and more was the perpetrator of domestic violence in their relationships. Catherine Knight had previous relationships with three other key men, marrying her first husband in 1974, meeting her second partner in 1986, and her third four years later in 1990. But would each partner reveal a similar pattern of behavior experienced by Price? These were blokes who were pulling the shirt across after they'd been stabbed by her. I mean, blokes who'd been, had their heads caved in with a frying pan, as Callot had infamously. I can't imagine that many men are physically intimidated by their spouse. It must be a very small group. And it's even harder to imagine when blokes like these, hard Aussie blokes, but they were. They lived in fear of their lives. They had simple needs, beer at the end of, you know, a hard working day, a woman who was there for them at home and, you know, somewhere nice to stay. So it was really quite extraordinary. She wasn't a great intellectual. She wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box by any standard. She didn't have great sort of, um, you know, conversational skills up at the pub where she'd go. She just had this allure about the sex. 
She didn't care when she crossed the line. That was the whole thing. She was completely without remorse when she would do these terrible things. She would go back and ask these men to come back to her, but it wasn't, oh, I'm really sorry for what I did. It was basically, you know, oh, you know, come on, come back. We've, we've got to stay together. As more unravels about this volatile woman, it is clear her irrational behaviour started when she was young. With Dave Callot, they certainly had their ups and downs, but their relationship lasted a while. He was the first one to get the hint of how violent she was, and it apparently happened on the wedding night when she tried to throttle him because she'd heard some story that on wedding night, mum and dad had had sex X plus six times. And uh, poor old Callot conked out after three goes or something because he'd, be he'd been drinking for two days. I think he was smart enough to know that the only way he was getting out of that relationship alive was to run away, and he did. She placed the first child on the railway tracks where the coal trains go through. That was all in response to uh, Callot leaving her. This is probably the first public demonstration of just how excessive Catherine could be. Endangering her baby's life landed Knight in a psychiatric unit an extreme measure that drove Kellett to change his mind about the relationship and go back to her. But this didn't last for long. In 1986, Knight met David Saunders, a local miner. They were madly in love in the early days, you know, but like all of Catherine's relationships, the honeymoon period generally lasted one year to 18 months. It didn't last much longer than that. And in her mind, it would always be that they're cheating on me, even when they weren't, or that they're not spending enough time with me. And Knight's irrational nature exploded in the most disturbing way. He went out and cut his dog's throat. Was the dog dead? It was a clean cut, they said. Catherine Mary Knight from Aberdeen in New South Wales has just admitted to murdering her partner, John Price. But instead of revealing what she has done and why, she is instead claiming to be the victim of domestic abuse. However, investigations into her past are revealing a very different story as Bob Wells tracks down previous partners. One of them has been stabbed in the stomach with scissors. She's sliced the, um, a puppy's neck, killing a young puppy at eight weeks old because she was cranky. I mean, you know, they just went back time and time again. Saunders had to run away and hide. When he left her, he hid in another town. He pretended he was somewhere else. He put up this elaborate facade. After that relationship broke down, Knight soon moved on to her next with a former co-worker in the local abattoir. She left John Chillingworth, you know. She said, I don't want you, and she, she cheated on him with one of her other partners in between, you know. So it's kind of like, I think she was just getting to that point where she was desperate. Her looks were leaving her, such as they were. There was not that many options around in town. I think most of the men folk of Aberdeen and the Hunter Valley had got her measure by now. They knew of her reputation. They knew that, you know, she wasn't shy with, you know, landing a fist on their face or, you know, stabbing them with whatever implement she could get. This window into her checkered past is now revealing a woman who has resorted to extreme violence throughout her life, often with no remorse or consequences. Separate to her volatile relationships, an insight into her personal and professional life may also shed light onto her unusual character. Aberdeen's, in its early stages, was a, um, a farming area with a large abattoirs where Catherine worked. Knight had worked in the local slaughterhouse for years, starting as a general labourer in 1971. It was not long before she progressed to the offal room, working on animal carcasses before honing her skills as a meat slicer in the boner's room. This was her trade for over a decade. 
But could her diligence at work have masked or encouraged something more sinister? She had an obsession with death. She loved to nick arteries in the, in the abattoir and scrape the marrow out. I mean, who loves working in an abattoir, for God's sake? She had this, had this fascination with knives, and it was quite apparent that she could handle a knife. This morbid fixation with the macabre side of life is also evident when officers search Knight's own home, just down the road from Price's in Aberdeen. It was quite a bizarre premises, and we found that Catherine had a severe fascination with violent and bizarre movies, which she retained on VHS. The house that she owned is just full of macabre stuffed animals. It's quite a dark, gloomy house. It never, it didn't give you a feeling that it was ever vibrant, open and, and, and light. And extensive police inquiries with family members reveal some shocking warning signs from night. Could the writing have been on the wall for some time? Catherine was workshopping the crime in her own mind and you know, just dropping hints to the family here and there. There was information from uh, her brother that she did say those particular words, that she would kill Pricey and um, she'd get away with it because they'd think she was mad. There was other comments, um, uh, if Pricey takes me back, uh, he takes me back till the death. With these admissions, along with all the other evidence, would Knight admit to her barbaric act in court? Less than one year on from the death of John Price, his family and friends must face seeing her in court. At no time, either as a barrister or as a judge, uh, did I ever strike anything of the horrific nature of Catherine Mary Knight's case. She pleaded not guilty, and the trial began in the conventional way. She sat in the dock. She was quite small, unimpressive. In a crowd, you would certainly never notice her. Despite admitting to killing her partner during the police interview, Knight still enters a not guilty plea. But as a trial commences, she sensationally does a U-turn and asks to change the plea to guilty, but doesn't give a reason. I was somewhat nervous about this because I was concerned that if I took a guilty plea, sentenced her, she would then appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeal and say she was insane at the time that she made the plea of guilty. I decided that I should get a court expert to examine her and the psychiatrist came to exactly the same conclusion as the other psychiatrist that had seen her, namely that she was not insane, she was quite sane, but she was a bad woman. Remarkably, despite the severity of Price's injuries, Knight has carried out this sustained and calculated attack with a sane mind. However, the court does reveal something else about Knight. Three psychiatrists all diagnosed her with um, a personality disorder, which is not a psychiatric illness. It's actually just, it's a disorder of the way you relate to other people. And that's what she was like. If she didn't get her own way, if you crossed her, or if she imagined that you had, you know, done something or said something about her, she would get payback. Justice Barry O'Keefe allows a guilty plea and the jury is dismissed but the graphic evidence is still heard. Throughout the whole of the evidence, it didn't matter what a witness said, she didn't look at the witness. It didn't matter what the photograph or the video was, she didn't look at that. She sat looking straight ahead, absolutely impassive. There was never a sign on her face of any reaction to any of the evidence. There was one time, and I believe it was when they were, it was either they were describing the crime scene or it might have even been the crime scene tape where she started rocking violently backwards and forwards and wailing and falling on the floor and really carrying on a treat. This outburst is in stark contrast to the killer's usual measured behavior. 
but Knight knows exactly what she is doing. Um, when she wanted an adjournment, she manipulated her behaviour so that she got it. Thereafter, she resumed the same mien as she'd had before. Uh, but I didn't think she'd switched off. Eventually, in a highly charged courtroom, the judge reveals the sentence to be handed to this killer. To sentence any person to life imprisonment is a big thing. To sentence a woman to life imprisonment, for me, was an even bigger thing. This was as bad a case as you got, so she had to go to jail for the term of her life. Catherine Mary Knight is the first female in Australia to be sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Today she became the first woman to be jailed for life under truth in sentencing laws, ensuring she'll die behind bars. She's been branded a danger to the community, capable of murdering anyone who crosses her. She's shown no remorse. She had not acknowledged that she had any problem at all. Such a person, if released, is not unlikely to do the same again. There's the real prospect of it. There was a lot of cheering by family members and those sorts of things. But I was quite happy that, um, that we'd done a successful job and, and that justice was done in the end and that Catherine Knight got what she deserved. The little unturned stone for me is that the missing link from Catherine not saying and filling in that gap. When I was interviewing Catherine, you can catch someone's eye and you say to yourself, I'm being bullshitted to here. It's a combination of catching their eye, catching the expression on their face, that you know that this person is feeding you only what she wants to feed you. And that's why I still believe that Catherine would now be able to provide information in, as to what took place and why it took place. Knight failed in an appeal of her sentence and will never be released. She takes to prison many secrets as to her motivation and reasons for ending someone else's life so brutally. And the mystery of Price's missing money on the night of his death still remains. Catherine Knight doesn't make mistakes. She doesn't do things by accident. She has a well thought out plan and she executes it the way she wants to. I can tell you that I found this a very stressful matter. In fact, after it was over, I didn't eat meat for about three months. The thought of meat reminded me of the events in this house. She's not just a woman who's capable of violence or a woman who's capable of murder. She's a woman who reveled in this macabre, sinister, disgusting behaviour that is off the scale, that we cannot permit in a civilised society.